Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about a revival, a Eucharistic revival. That's right. We're joined by Tim Glemkowski. He's the National Director of the Eucharistic Congress. And we're going to talk about all the things that the USCCB and Catholics across America are going to do to renew faith in the Holy Eucharist. The Source and Summit the Eucharist, Jesus Christ himself, the celebration that the apostles experienced firsthand that we get to experience every single day as Catholics. We're going to tell you a lot more about what's coming in this year. We're joined with Tam Glemkowski. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I can't think of a better thing to talk about. I had a Eucharistic mm -hmm. conversion. I've heard you preach, preach from the pulpit about why you embrace <laughs> celibacy. You're like, because this is Jesus. You know, like, I, love, I love it when you, you share that. So it's going to be great to talk with you, Tim, about you know all the things that the bishops are uh, pulling their resources together to help promote this very, very important sacrament, Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fulton Sheen said the greatest love story of all time is contained in a tiny white host. And that's why the Eucharist is so important to Catholics. And to start to revive the the belief and the theology and the love for Christ in the Eucharist is one of the most important things that we need to do as a church. And I think that is the goal and the mission of what the National Eucharistic Congress is doing and then ultimately the National Eucharistic Congress, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, which is going to happen in 2024 in Indianapolis. So really excited to talk about this. It is, it's, a, it's very exciting. And whenever we think of revival, whenever we think of renewal, you know, who is the author of that? Right. <laughs> it's not any of us. It's, it's Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who revives. He is the one who renews. And it's so important that we would order ourselves in that practice of anamnesis, this fancy word that means remembering. We've got to order ourselves to remember that Jesus is the author of the revival of the human person and society itself. And man, do we need renewal and revival. Yeah, so Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself and what uh, being the National Director of the Eucharist Eucharistic <laughs> Congress <laughs> <Yes>. means. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. No, I appreciate you all having me. It's yeah. it's uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's an important work, and I'm with you, Father. It's it's something God does, and we just, we heard on Sunday, right, in the gospel, uh, you're the salt of the earth. But what happens if salt loses its taste? Taste. I think that's the question that the bishops are sort of trying to address with this Eucharistic revival. Is like, how is the church going to be healed, formed, converted, and unified through the Eucharist? So, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm from Chicago originally. Had my conversion, you know, Ryan, too. I was 18 years old through an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist and got kind of involved in this project early through some of my work with the USCCB that I was doing. And then uh, in November of 2021, when the bishops voted to start this, you know, apostolate that would do this 2024 Eucharistic Congress, the first one in, you know, 83 years, and then carry that work forward, um, just felt super called to this work. So I started in April of this year. And yeah, we're planning kind of for that generational moment, this National Eucharistic pilgrimage leading to it. So um, yeah, it's uh, God's doing something big right now. So I'm glad we get a chance to talk about it. That's awesome. Yeah, I can't think of a better person to do it than you too. You got so much energy, and like you said, you had a Eucharistic conversion. So, can't think of anybody better to yeah, do that. And, and thank God that you know the Lord has shepherded you to the position that you are in right now, because we we are desperate to root ourselves more deeply in faith. You know, the world as it presents itself right now, and and the conditions of um, social disintegration, really. Uh, we are in desperate need for solidarity. We're in desperate need for a movement of unification. And uh, how appropriate that the bishops have in college discerned that we need this time of, you know, entering more deeply into the mystery of who Jesus is in the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. You know, the numbers and the statistics and the exact numbers elude me but of people who actually believe in the true presence of our Lord in the, in the Blessed Sacrament are incredibly alarming. And this is one of the core tenets of our faith. And this is... It's the source. The and source and summit. summit. Yeah. It's like literally like if you, if you, if you go into McDonald's, like you're, you're not going to order a steak. Right? I mean, you're, you're, it's like it's not on the menu. And so for people to not even know 
that like you're consuming Jesus Christ and this is like the most amazing part of our faith that that is definitely a, a sign that we, we need some re-education here <laughs> we really do and that it's I think it's less than 50 percent actually believe one of the core tenets of our faith and there's a lot of reasons for that you know there's bad catechesis there's dis uh, believing hearts there is societal pressures there's all kinds of things that have eroded that faith but if you look at the history of saints in the church, every single saint, every story I've ever read had a deep love, number one, for our Lord in the Eucharist. It's unavoidable um, to the faith, and that it's so, uh, I guess, missing in today's pews. It's really alarming. So I think the timing of this is not only um, fortuitous, it's necessary. Yes. Yeah, it really is. Tim, out of curiosity, you know, can you share a little bit more about your Eucharistic conversion that, that you experienced? Because I believe people really are, are deeply impacted by testimony. And, and as a priest, I try to listen attentively to how Jesus has touched people's lives. So if you could share that, I would love to. I think the viewers and the listeners would, would love to experience that uh, with you. Yeah, no, and it's part of why I care about this so much. I really feel like the church is in a moment where the urgency of this is because of some of the statistics you share, but also because of sort of what's going on in the world right now. We're like, we're in this moment where the Christendom culture is no longer, right? We're like more and more, we're as a church going to have to really propose the gospel to people and not just presume that because they grow up in the faith that they're going to just kind of, you know, matriculate in to like practice it, like they're going to have to experience and encounter something that changes them and is real. So that, that was for me. So yeah, kind of cradle Catholic family, Chicago, you know, suburbs, Polish Catholic dad, Irish Catholic mom, like just a classic story. But it's it's funny, like looking back on it, um, I, I don't think I ever heard, you know, like, and I, no discredit to anyone. It's not about condemnation, but like in the pews or even in like, I went to a Catholic high school, I was getting in a lot of trouble in middle school. So my parents tried to send me to a Catholic high school to, you know, hope it would kind of straighten me out. And uh, I don't remember anyone ever actually saying like, you know, what we believe is that that's actually Jesus. Like it just, it yeah. never really totally occurred to me. And my mom, because I was getting in so much trouble, pulled me out of football practice uh, one Friday to throw me on a bus to go to Steubenville, Ohio for a youth conference one summer, you know, kicking and screaming. <laughs> and while I was there for the first time, heard sort of the gospel, like this, this reality, this, like this story of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And it just like really wrecked me, went to confession, kind of had this whole conference experience, heard someone preach really powerfully about uh, this night of adoration that was coming this Saturday night. And that this is, we believe that this is actually Jesus, you know, really present, going to be among us. And then they processed Jesus in the Eucharist around this field house. We were all sort of kneeling on the ground. And it's, it's like the defining moment of my life, you know, like looking back on it, hard to describe in some ways, but it's, you know, Pope Benedict XVI said uh, in uh, Deus Caritas Est, his first encyclical as Pope, means God is love. He says, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty ideal, but it's the fruit of an encounter with a person. And I think that's the best way I can describe it is just like for the first time, face to face with Jesus in the Eucharist, God became a person to me. Like there was something real there and it um, it kind of shattered me. You know what I mean? It took a while, honestly, for like me to choose to follow God. I'd say about a year later that I actually really made the choice. Like, I'm going to conform my life to this. I'm going to like live, you know, because it's just it's sin is hard to leave behind. But um, yeah, in that moment, like that's that's the definitive moment of my life and kind of nothing's ever been the same. So when I think of that and I think of, you know, the 200 or so I'm a millennial, you know, millennials that graduated from St. Francis High School in Wheaton, Illinois with me. Not a lot are practicing anymore. And I can't help but think in some ways it's because some of what I was blessed to encounter and experience and like, you know, like kind of like the good thief, you know, in some ways, like God just kind of reached into my life in that moment. It, it, I just think things would be different. Maybe some of those numbers would be different if more people uh, encountered God and his love in that kind of powerful life changing way in the Eucharist. I, I can't help but believe that. And thank God for strong parenting too. You know, yeah, like, I was just thinking, mama, right? mama, yeah, mama, thank God mama. for a, a strong mom. Yeah, man. You know who who kind Ned of. Lemkowski is five foot two, and 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 she's a mama bear. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, That's yeah. awesome. 
I love hearing. I love hearing. I, testimonies I had a very like similar story. Mm-hmm. We've shared it uh, dozens of times, and and it, uh, I was a little older, you know, like, and I had been through a lot, and uh, I remember moving next door to an adoration chapel because I was driving all around town to go to adoration to 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 sit with Jesus. And then somebody told me there was a perpetual adoration chapel. I was like, whoa, 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 they do this all the time? That's right. Where is this? It's kind of funny looking back to see how naive I was. Or just like, I didn't really understand too much. Yeah. But I have to agree with you, um, Tim, that uh, my pastor uh, growing up, I remember my neighbor, Miss Horner, going to him and saying, we would like to have Eucharistic adoration. And she says she got shut down at least three dozen times. And I'm like, man, you'd think one one of these times he'd let you do it. And so, Sally Horner, big shout out to oh, her yeah. because she is very persistent. Yes. And she is a strong witness of the faith. God yeah. bless her. Yeah. So I, I look at it the same way, you know, Tim, and it kind of full circle. I brought my kids to, um, I think, uh, any Hickman was doing something in Houston. And so we all drove down there and my kids were there in adoration with us. And I, when we were just driving home, I was like, what was your favorite part of this conference? And I was, you know, I was thinking like, oh, you know, the face painting and this and that, (laughs) you know, all the stuff that they were doing while we were, you know, attending conference stuff. And it, and it was adoration, you know? And it's like that, that is even more of a reason to do this is because People want this encounter. Yes. Deep inside, they were yes. created for this encounter. Like their whole life is built mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. this encounter that we have with Christ, whether it's in personal prayer on a daily basis and or whether it's this like life-changing event. Like you were made for that. Mm-hmm. You know, the so often, whether it's Ave Maria Youth Conference, Steubenville Conference, um, you know, NCYC, all these different things. When you ask the kids, hey, what was your most impactful yeah. experience on this trip or this, this uh, you know, was it one of the talks? Was it the fun? You guys were playing Frisbee, whatever. It's always Eucharistic adoration. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even with my some of my programming here, I have a, a core group that uh, works our family life office. And they'll spend so much time stressing over, you know, the date or the, the games or the different, like the design for the, it's like expose Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. You Let Jesus why, do you know what why Jesus I'm does. It's because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, okay. <laughs> got, it, got it. But no, it's 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 true. But we have to be reminded, right? We've got to we be do. reminded because we we're like sheep. I mean, yeah. the scriptures all say it, and it's like we can just kind of go off, and our attention shifts, and next thing you know, our humanity yeah. is prone and inclined toward that shift, and it, it's okay. We're all human, but. Let's make sure that pastorally we have structures in place for which, shifting um, that attention. Yeah, which I can't wait for you to share, Tim, because, I mean, like, this is obviously I'm very passionate about this as you are. Um, and so now you're dealing, you know, in, in our particular cases, you know, the CFRs did a retreat and, you know, uh, oh, Steubenville does a retreat. Yeah. And, and so They're but great. now it's like the bishop saying, hey, we need a revival here. And, and I'm sure there's been a lot of work done mm-hmm. uh, on their end. And we just interviewed a bishop. Um, and so I, I'm sure there's a lot of work done. So I'm, I'm kind of excited, like on a pastoral, like the ground game of the church, like how is this going to materialize? Because I mean, I'd love to be a part of it, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah, it's, you know, I think what's unique or what's captured the attention or imagination of a lot of people is I've been around the church for a while now. I know you all have, too. And I've seen things come and go, right? Different initiatives or strategic plans or whatever. And I think what's kind of different about this is it's sort of like a vision that's being cast, the bishops and Bishop Cousins and, and the USCCB, and then sort of an invitation to people to just like respond. Like, hey, if you're if you're one of these people where your life has been changed by Jesus in the Eucharist, and you know, I, I, I know a priest father who says, uh, Jesus is the battering ram in the Eucharist, like into people's mm-hmm. hearts. You know, it's like, yeah, we can do all the skits and games and talks and whatever, but like at some point, just let the like let him do the warm <laughs> you know. Amen. And um I, I do, I think there's a there's sort of an invitation to grassroots creativity with this, which is unique, like just enough clarity to kind of empower and enable that. Um, but I think it's really about, yeah, like um kind of inviting people back to. Um, I don't know, just to be like totally candid, right? Like the world is hurting right now, right? right? Like the last five years have been wild and the church is hurting right now. 
you know, the last five years, 10 years, 20, they've been wild in a lot of different ways. And I think what com- captivated me about this is kind of having worked, I've worked for an archdiocese with a, an archbishop that I really have respected and and, and appreciated and, and loved the work I was getting to do there. I've kind of run my own apostolate, done a lot of speaking all over. And I've had this question kind of burning in my heart the whole time of like, w- like, you know, when will you save your people, Lord? Like, what do you know? Like, yeah. what, like yeah. I think that's just my prayer in my heart over time is like, like, Lord, don't you see, don't you see where we are and what we need? And I, and I really have seen in this, and this is not supposed to be just, you know, because this is my, my job or something like that. Like I'm here because I believe this. It's like, I really see this as part of God's response. Like, I think he said kind of to the bishops prophetically, like, just bring people back to my heart. Like there, you know, it's, it's it, to cut through with such simple clarity. Like that's just the kind of thing God would do. Right. It's like, to just say, if you bring people back to me, I'll do it. I'll do the work. So it's, yeah, it's a revival of faith and belief in the Eucharist. You know, for those of us who don't know that, have that relationship, uh, for people who, what's weird for me is when you do these studies, the stats, <clears throat> some of the stats are people come every week and they don't believe, which to me is wild, right? Like I wouldn't be, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're chasing our kids in the back, right? And then there's other people who will say, yeah, I believe that that's what the church teaches I grew up Catholic and they don't, they don't come. So it's like, there's all these, all these disconnects, you know, that, that are, you know, real kind of speak to real stories and problems that are in people's hearts um, in, in so many ways. So it is a revival of belief in the Eucharist, but it's also, in my opinion, a revival through the Eucharist. Like if God's going to do something new in our church to help us be on mission for the life of the world, he's going to do it by bringing people back to him in like a simple and clear way. And that, invitation that the bishops have kind of prophetically articulated and then we're all being invited to respond to that's what's fired me up about it as you can tell very something well to, said. yeah very well said and something to add too is the consideration of christmas and easter you know where every church whether it's a mediocre church uh, you know like an inactive church a church right. in the sticks every church is packed right <laughs> christmas and Easter, what's happening? Like Jesus is drawing people to Himself. It, it's not like all oh, the cute uh, Christmas mass where the priest dresses up like Santa Claus and hands it. You know, we, we had breakfast with Santa. You know, like it's not that. It's it's Jesus Christ. It's the everlasting meal with Jesus. And it's, it's not breakfast with Santa. And 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 it's just <laughs> where I think we can really kind of exercise creativity and be a good neighbor and love our neighbor is to facilitate that encounter at a deeper level. You know, if people really truly believed that Christ was present in the Eucharist, oh my goodness they would gracious. walk on their hands and knees and crawl into the church any moment they have to worship <clears throat> our Lord present in the Eucharist. But <clears throat> that that reality is lost on all of us, right? It really is. So Tim, and maybe you could help define this, is what are the bishops trying to get people to know about the Eucharist? What do Catholics believe substantially that what is the teaching of the church on the Eucharist that people don't know that need to know? Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, just really simply put, right? Like we don't believe that the Eucharist is just a symbol or it's sort of like a nice spiritual kind of thing that we, we actually believe that the the bread and wine that we bring up onto the altar that when the priest says the proper words, right, over those those prayers that were instituted by Jesus 2,000 years ago, that the bread and wine actually becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And then for us to consume that, right? So like this, I've been kind of struck by this word of like worship recently, like what is worship, you know? And, and worship at the heart of it is something that only really like humans and angels can do, right? Like it's to give a gift of yourself. And we worship in the Catholic faith, like our idea of worship is that God gives a gift of himself and in response to that, asks us to receive that and then like give our hearts back to him. And so that exchange, that relationship is what we're made for from the beginning. So the Eucharist is not just like kind of one of our nice traditions or like it's the whole thing. Like this is everything God wanted to do in Jesus from all of history to bring us back into relationship with him and to love us uh, and transform us through that love is like found in that meal. And so this is where, Ryan, you're saying like, if that's it, if that's true and if that's real uh, and if that's actually what God's trying to do, which like the scriptures say is 
you know, like over and over and over again, like St. Paul talks about this. The early church talks about this, that this is what they believe from the very beginning. John chapter six is like, couldn't be more clear that Jesus is trying to like drill into our heads. This is how I want to be with you to the end of the age. If that's what it is, and that's the whole thing has sort of been confected out of that mystery and configured from the, like the church exists because of the Eucharist in some ways, right? If that's true and we don't get that, yeah, it's not just like, like a, it's not just like, well, we need to like, we pull the muscle. It's like, we have a broken spine as yeah, a church. Yeah, wow. We don't really know Very that, good. you know? Yeah, and you're right. There is so many examples that this is what the church has always taught and always believed. Even if you look at the institution of the Eucharist, if you look at John 6, truly I say to you, this is my blood and my, my body and my blood. Unless you consume it, you will have no life in you. If you look at the, the road to Emmaus, if you look at the Didache, if you look at St. Paul saying, if you receive unworthily, mm -hmm. you bring your own condemnation mm -hmm. on yourself. This has been the consistent teaching of of the church from the very beginning. And that's why we call it the source and summit of our faith. And, and then you follow it through tradition. You follow yeah. it through these giants in the faith, you know, these doctors of the church, these amazing, like Ignatius of Antioch, yeah. you know, like <clears throat> these are, this is, you're, you could clearly follow apostolic succession. You can clearly follow the orthopraxis of the Catholic church, the way that we are orthodoxly right. practicing what Jesus instituted himself. There is a clear lineage. And when you go into the historical lineage of that, it becomes this occasion of recognizing even more deeply, wow, <laughs> Jesus is calling me into this oneness, into this glorious universality of what is the Catholic faith. Yeah. Catholicos is universal. He's calling us into this universal love, this return to the Father. I love a lot of the theological uh, terms mm. that you're you're throwing out and just mm. expressing yourself, Tim, because it's like I'm hearing Thomas Aquinas <laughs> just like flowing out of you. And yeah. it's, it is, it's like, it's this beautiful exchange that's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're a part of that return to the Father's love. Yeah. You know, I love that it's so fundamental to the early church that when the Romans are hearing about this new cult that's coming out of this province way out in the east, and they're like, yeah, I don't know really what they teach. I don't know. They, they're can some kind of cannibal cult. They eat their god. That's how the even, the even the earliest church was perceived by outsiders, that it was so central that the first thing people thought of is like, that's they, a great point. they claim to eat their god. Yeah, great point. That's how important it was. Now, that's obviously them not understanding Catholic theology or the teaching Who's of the, the church. Who's the evangelical brother, the uh, Asian guy out, out in California? He's... he's um, yeah, yeah man. Chen. Did you hear some of his stuff? I mean, he's like getting closer and closer really? to the Catholic faith. Well, I don't think that you can look at the history of the church and then look at the scriptures and look at how the first generations practiced and executed that faith that they received from Christ and the apostles mm -hmm. and their devotion to the Eucharist and say that this is not a central tenet of the faith. Mm -hmm. And no. nowadays, I mean, a lot of the church, a lot of churches, even our church has been boiled down to really kind of a societal nice club, mm -hmm. right? It's like, Look, we want to do good by others. We want to, you know, treat people well, and you know that's all fine and well. It's but like we're missing social, the yeah. mystery. We're, we're like we're, a social justice. Yeah, uh, it's not coming it. from the grace of God and the loving mercy that He shows us, and being <clears throat> being a part of the vine, yeah. right? And the vine is is the Eucharist. I yeah, mean, he, he he expresses that clearly, you know, about having life within you. Mm -hmm. You know that the Eucharist was it. The, one of the things I want to kind of go back to um, pastorally, you could probably add to this too as well, is you mentioned uh, a prayer in, in your heart that I share with you, Tim. It's, it's uh, you know, the, the things that are going on in the world and the suffering. God's given me a, a, some sort of grace to see enormous amounts of this in our, our world. Obviously, it's visible, but, but to, to always be moved with prayer for that, just the conversion of sinners, you know, just... Uh, the, the attack on vulnerability, like in children, um, like all these things, these, the, these demonic things and, and just pray, pray for them. I, I think about like, you know, the need for mercy in our society as, uh, as a part of the relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. is that I love him so much. And I, I'm, I experienced this grace of mercy in my life ever since I first had this encounter and, and I think a lot of people just don't dig in enough to, to understand that, that that's, that's how you know him, yes. right? I mean, you know God from his mercy, right? Mm -hmm. You are joyful because he has forgiven you. You are forgiving others because he has forgiven you first. So 
like I think a lot about this as uh, as almost like a healing um, a healing part of our church. Mm-hmm. It's so often pastorally, you know, you you're walking with somebody that they express, you know, Father, I I cannot forgive this person. You know, mm-hmm. like I I just cannot do it. But when when you really look closely, none of us can. You yeah, know? to err is err is human. To forgive is divine. You know that that expression mm-hmm. that's so common. Um, I, I was coming across on my feed um, on YouTube because I've got like a bunch of basketball and, and hip hop <laughs> stuff that comes up like constantly. And uh, and it was Kobe Bryant. And he said, you know, God is good. He was being interviewed by Stephen A. Smith on ESPN. And it's like, God is good. This was early in his career. Um, he says, you know that, but like, how do you know that? Like Stephen A. is like, how do you know that? And it's like, you know, when when the cross hits you and you can't carry it, and God picks you up and that cross and carries you, then you know it. Mm-hmm. And and God is God is great. Yeah. You know, like, and that's and that's the point is just the mercy of God is our only hope. Jesus's mercy being materialized in your life, there is no greater fidelity that to to any power or any institution or any other type of. It's drawn from that. When mm-hmm. Jesus lifts you up and unburdens you from your sin, when Jesus loves you at your deepest, darkest moments, like that, <laughs> you know, I'm getting I I love it. right now, man. <laughs> but I mean, like that yeah. is why there's faith in the church. And yeah. that at the very core of the Eucharist, on top of that, not only does he pick you up mm. and carry you, he gets so deeply rooted inside of you. Right. He is within you. You know, that's what I was trying to get over to that guy when we were in that Vegas conference, but it wasn't delivering well, I don't think. That. <laughs> it's, it's in, in you, man. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. the beauty of it, man. Yeah, Father, we need more. I think we need more priests who who, who cry about the mercy of God, in my oh. opinion. I think the world would be, you know. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, we've already got but, three um, of them right here, and they're all Father Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He counts as three. But that's it. No, I, Brian, I think that's right with the healing piece. Like, we, we always talk about these words. Like, what do we think God is trying to do? Again, it's like this prophetic thing, this you know invitation. Like, what's God saying to the church he wants to do? He wants to heal, form, convert, and unify the church so that we can be sent. Like, how are we going to be able to be sent on mission? Well, we're going to need all four of those things to happen first, converted, formed, but also healed and unified. And I do think that the Eucharist can do that in a unique way, like the power of God. We've even talked about with this Congress coming up in 2024. The, the So it's the first, the 10th National Eucharist of Congress, the first one in a very long time. I, I think God's going to heal people there in like a bunch of ways, you know, like I, I really, it, it's kind of strange to be working on it. And, but you just get these like kind of senses as God starts to say things where it's like, I think it's going to be more than just a conference. Like, I think he wants to do something, you know, and I think that's going to include um, some, some kind of, you know, yeah, powerful, uh, some powerful things. Yeah, you can count on me being there to I'll watch be, that. I'll be there too. Uh, well, like look oh, at yes. look at World Youth Day back in Denver in the '90s when JP2 came, mm-hmm. and how many priests said they were there, mm-hmm. and how that changed their life. Mm-hmm. Just that gathering. So, I mean, I think I read on your website that you're looking to have somewhere around eighty thousand people get together at this conference, at this revival, and inspire in them a greater faith in the Eucharist, and then send them out. I mean, that is a continuation of the Great Commission. You know, but then you're sending them out with this Eucharistic purpose and love. Um, and like you said, God's doing something with that. And if you could bring them there, you know. So tell us, Tim, a little bit more about what specifically is happening. What are some of the actions that people are taking? How can people participate? What is this whole yeah. Eucharistic Is there revival? something we're looking for? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, with the event, yeah, 80,000 is what the stadium can hold, Lucas Oil Stadium. Yeah. Uh, but we, we just open pre-registration just to bish, like bishops bringing their de- delegation before. So public registration opens February 15th, 2023. We open it up a little bit early and we sold like 20,000 tickets right away. So we're, we're already trying to figure out what do we need to do if we need to grow the event a little bit. So we're, you know, scrambling, but um, the uh, yeah, I think, so this year it's this three-year process and each year kind of has a focus. So this was like the diocesan year. And really what that meant for us was diocese focusing on their leaders, how to like invite Father, you know, pastors into this, right? Like it depends on effectively pastors adopting this movement as their own for their parish if it's really going to happen. Like that's, 
in my mind, that's like the Uber driver of this, you know, it's like without drivers, you don't have, you know, there's no Uber. It's like without pastors really doing this in their parish, there's no revival in, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, so, you know, this year was kind of about like leader engagement and really kind of just this invitation to personal, like re-encounter, like in my own life, I've actually been like thinking and asking like, how do I kind of, what as a family, what do we need to do to come, you know, kind of closer to Jesus and the Eucharist? And then next year, starting Feast of Corpus Christi 2023, this summer, the question is, all right, people in the pews, you know, either kind of those who, yeah, believe, but don't come, come, but don't believe, um, or don't come, don't believe, you know, but those who are like kind of Catholic adjacent, parish adjacent, how do we reach them? So there's like a small group initiative that we're going to invite every parish to do. It's really about, you know, reinvigorating uh, worship, devotion, you know, inviting people back into the mystery of that encounter at mass, in processions, in adoration, like those liturgical moments. It's about personal encounters, bringing people to that kind of moment of encounter. Um, it, it's kind of about a, a, a missionary sending and it's about, you know, robust formation, like really providing something that kind of shows both proposes the church's teaching, but invites belief to it too, which I think can be two different things, you know, um, in some ways. So after that, at the end of the parish years is the, that big moment. So we're going to start walking north, south, east, and, and west, uh, Pentecost Sunday, 2024, from four parts in the country leading uh, to Indianapolis. Pilgrim groups are going to process with Jesus in the Eucharist, uh, from San Francisco, from, from Northern Minnesota, from Brownsville, Texas, and then from, uh, coming through Houston and, uh, and then from, uh, you know, the East coast from Connecticut as well too, to Lucas Oil Stadium for these five days, which I think is going to be like a world youth day, 93 type moment for the church of, you know, a renewed kind of missionary sending, which is going to push us into that third year of the revival, which is about, all right, now we've done it at a diocesan level. We've done it at a parish level. How do we now go to the to the margin? So that, that can look like a lot of different things. One thing we, we did was um, this year, like we, um, you know, we hear tons of stuff. There's pastors who are processing, you know, every first Friday around their parish boundary with the Eucharist. There's pastors who are, you know, 40 hour devotions and adoration, uh, Eucharistic retreats and parish missions and like all kinds of stuff, right? Just even homily series, how they're preaching at the mass, like all kinds of different stuff's happening at parishes. One thing we did is we just felt convicted in our own way to be part. One of the things for me is I've never wanted to just be a professional Christian, a professional Catholic, where it's like my job, but I don't live it with my family. We don't do it ourselves. So we talked to our pastor at our parish in, you know, just west of Denver. And we said, can we host uh, like a backyard adoration, like a backyard revival? And then, uh, you know, have tacos after. And we can invite a bunch of young families. And a, and a bunch came like with a range of, we had some music, some worship, like a, a small, you know, kind of like mini message, you know, at one point during it, but a range of faith, super devout families, like, you know, some not, it was really powerful. Like it felt, everyone we talked to was like, yeah, hey, I feel like God is like trying to show up through this thing. Um, so that's my encouragement is like, there's a bunch that could be done to invite that relationship and that encounter, but it's sort of like, just do something. Because I think God's trying to push into this thing, and He'll He'll Do He'll something. back you up. Right? <laughs> you, you know, Tim, you were you were um, mentioning this, the past five years. I mean, like you look at COVID, and when COVID hit, and the church went online, which was a, a great outcome. I mean, that was that was a blessing. And I remember watching uh, what was happening and praying for Italy, Northern Italy especially. And then um, this priest went and blessed, whole, you know, the, an entire tanker of, of water and, and exercise salt and they, you know, dropped it over like Northern Italy and uh -huh. stuff. And then I'm looking at my buddy, Jay Mello, Father Jay Mello, it, it, you know, he's up in the, in the, in the airplane with, uh, with the blessed sacrament. And I just take, I take both of those posts on my feet and I'm just like, all right, Jacksonville, like, let's do this, you know? And then I, next thing you know, I get a call from the County commissioner, the <laughs> sheriff, and then and it's like, you serious? I'm like, I'm absolutely serious. So then we, we get in a helicopter and we fly over, you know, Duval County, St. John's County, down to Flagler County. And we cover the perimeter. We're, we're blessing neighborhoods, homes, everything that literally covered from corner to corner, our farmlands out in the rural area of our county. And it was so powerful and to see families gathering 
you know, and and putting, you know, these huge crosses in their yard or like the kids wow. are outside decorating stuff in their front yard. And and one person had. Um, yeah, he, he, Father Maverick had his, uh, he had his uh, aviators on. I see what you're going on. for here. Yeah. He's cruising around. We're going. Yeah, I actually did have my sunglasses on. Yeah, he had them on. He's like, Father Maverick, he's out there just absolutely zapping everyone with the Eucharist. You know, it was, the whole northern Florida. And, and people were rallying outside, yeah. gathering. Wow. And it was, it was amazing. Dude, it was powerful. And then, you know, we were flying down to the southern part of the county. And I'm like, Sheriff, we're going to have to go. <laughs> To my mother's house because if I <laughs> if I go all the way down here and I don't bless my yeah. mom's house, she's not going to be happy. So I had to take care of my home county, and then, <laughs> and then it's like we we got we got uh, oh, we funny. got back, and then I'm like, Ma, you're not going to believe this, you know? I I um I was flying around with the blessed sacrament, <laughs> and then I said I even went down to the house. She says, Oh, honey, I know I was in your parking lot. I saw you fly over the church. <laughs> so she drove all the way up uh, from Palm Coast, but uh yeah, it's just it, it's it's so needed. And to see how Jesus, you know, brings people out of their darkness, out of their fears, giving them hope, you know, this is what Jesus does. And, and you know, it's time. You know, I, I think you guys would say I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly confrontational person. And I think confrontation is always viewed as bad, but I think this needs to be viewed as good. Um, even Christ says that be hot or cold, lukewarm gets spit out. And right now people aren't even saying yes or no, I believe what the church teaches. They don't even consider it. If Christ came today, he probably wouldn't be crucified. He'd be ignored. And people aren't even mm. given the opportunity to accept or reject this fundamental and life-altering proposition that the church makes on the Eucharist. So let's get this out there. Let's force the issue and say, this is what we teach. Do you believe this? Yeah. You know, And have that confrontation, have that encounter, and really make it something that is... You can't sit on the sidelines anymore in this mm -hmm. day and age. And, and that's what know, the church needs. Know what you believe. Yeah. Know what you believe. And, you know, so many, so many people have commented, our family, our friends on, on the show and our subscribers. And if you're listening to the show right now and you haven't subscribed, make sure you click subscribe. And you know you're loving the show already. So make sure you're hitting the thumbs up Encounter and sharing the this subscribe content. button. Yes. Confront uh, the subscribe confront button. Confront the subscribe button with the boom. It's the source and summit of hearing all of our <laughs> substantially <laughs> click like. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but but the whole you know the whole concept of of um, you know what we're getting at is if can you imagine all of us understanding this mystery like just saying you know I perceive this mystery and I I don't know it so I'm going to pursue it you know if every Catholic did that. You know, people look at me, they see a collar around my neck, and I'm wearing all black, and it's like I've got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. <laughs> I'm, it's still a mystery. Like, yeah. I am pursuing it with every amount of passion and zeal. Why? Because Jesus has revealed himself through this wonderful sacrament. So once that revelation takes place, and it's like, wow, gee, like your, your conversion story, guys, Tim, Ryan, I mean, you guys, we've all had that experience. That's why we are who we are, and that's why we're doing the show. You know, but it's not exclusive to us. It's I mean, not. That's, what, that's what the it's whole not. point like, is. Yeah. The whole point is, is like you too, like Jesus is coming to you in the blessed sacrament. And, and, you know, to what you're saying, Sheila, I think it's a really important point too, is go to your pastors, find out like, Hey, what can we do? Don't say, don't go to the pastor and say, what are you going are you to do? do? <laughs> Which everybody loves doing that. But like, no, what are you, what, what are we going to do? Father, how can we help? Can we, can we set up some tents? Can, what can we do for Corpus Christi? Can we do some processions? Can we do, you know, that's going to make your pastor very, very happy. That's it. No, I think in some ways I was thinking your, your story with the helicopter, like in my mind, the Eucharistic revival started March 27th, 2020, when in the middle of COVID in St. Peter's Square, the way the Pope chose to respond was to just expose the world to Jesus in the Eucharist. In my mind, that's it right there. Like the Holy Father showed the way already. So that's yeah, that was a powerful, that was powerful, a powerful moment. experience. I remember where I was. I was in the shrine of Our Lady of La Leche and we were live streaming I remember, yeah. and, uh, and commenting and yeah, that was amazing. I didn't know it happened, so I don't know where I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're not you. You're already converted. You already, you, Jesus already got you. He got he's, me. He's at me already. You're one of the 99. He's going for the one lost. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, I love it. So, you know, Tim, what are some ways that people can actively participate in this? I know you said go and talk to your pastors, but where are some, like, websites they can go to learn more about what you're doing? I think that would be important to learn. 
That's critical. Yeah. So to to us, the entryway into the revival is the newsletter subscribe button, kind of like you guys. It's like, so we just, we were trying to think it's this big kind of national movement. How do you keep people plugged into what's happening? Kind of the spirit and ethos of the revival. So eucharisticrevival.org, you know, kind of midway down the page, you'll see the newsletters, just put in your name and email and you'll get those kind of um, communications regularly. You can go to eucharisticcongress.org too. We're just kind of launching our our 2.0 website that has all the information about the MCs and, and some of the event and what we're trying to do and the schedule and all that stuff is going up in the next uh in the next couple of weeks too. But that's really what I'd recommend. Social media, Instagram and Facebook around there. Um, because it's yeah, again, a national movement. It's like, how do we just for us, it's just about communicating sort of the, the heart of this thing out and then and then inviting people to respond. So more to come. Yeah, I would I, I'm with you, Father. I'm always about like uh don't just bring up the problem, propose a solution. So it's like, bring something, something burning on your heart to do. Don't make the pastor try to guess what's in your head and what you'd like to see happen. Like bring him an idea and tell him you'll bring five families together to get it done. And um, yeah. So I'll make sure that all of those links are in the comments below. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go in the comments below. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast player, go to catholictalkshow.com, look for this episode's page and you'll see all those links so that you could figure out how you could participate and subscribe to that mailing list. Um, now, real quick, I want to give a quick shout out to our two sponsors. I want to give a shout out to Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is a men's program that helps you become the man God intends you to be through some very core practices of fraternity, asceticism, and prayer. These are proven practices that go all the way back to the Desert Fathers and the early church. And this year, over 45,000 Catholic and non-Catholic men took part in this program and used it to become a better man for their God, for their church, and for their family. So we can't encourage it enough. Go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash exodus to learn more about that. Yeah, exodus, I got to tell you, you know, even if you don't have 90 days, they've got so many yeah. things out there yeah. on that website. So you want to definitely go to their website, check it out. And it is really a phenomenal program rallying men's response to asceticism and enriching their faith by way of fellowship and walking with other brothers, growing in the disciplines of the age-long traditions of the Catholic Church. And what's happening effectively is it's changing the face of the world because it's spreading, you know, along with our other sponsor, Halo. Halo is the number one Catholic prayer app on the App Store today. Mm -hmm. It's been that way, and it's not going anywhere for a very <laughs> long time. They have phenomenal content, next-level stuff. And yeah. they're covering the rich heritage and traditions of the faith in the spiritualities and charisms of so many people throughout the ages. Podcasts. They've got uh, Michael, you know, um, Michael Schmitz. Michael Schmitz. <laughs> yeah, that's his name. Father, <laughs> Father Mike Schmitz. Of course, Father uh, Mike Schmitz, my buddy. Uh, Father uh, Michael Schmitz. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's, he's just know, phenomenal. What's really cool, I use that app every day. Mm -hmm. And when I started a group called the Mama's Boys, yeah. and we, we pray that. the rosary every day on the app, and I can see when all the guys are praying it, yeah. I can see what they're praying. It's really neat. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I think I might want to start a t Catholic talk show group on it later. So, but so Tim, these guys, great idea. Good idea. These guys uh, give me a hard time, you know, and, and always say, you're no Father Mike Schmitz, you're a B, you're a B lister, and, <laughs> and like, all sorts of stuff. And uh, and it's funny because, you know, a lot of my parishioners watch the show, and, <laughs> and we, we're rolling out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a year for the new year, and then and then his catechism in, in a year. And, and when, you know, I had uh, Matt Taylor go up, and he's, he's sharing everybody, like, if you want to be on the list and we're going to have a little community and uh, sign up afterwards or whatever. And we're doing Father Mike Schmitz. And then I look out of the community and people are just straight up laughing. <laughs> like, you know, you know, Father Mike Schmitz. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's, so funny. it's like my parish is roasting me. You know? oh, it's like, gosh. Thank well, you. Look, look at what we started. I know, but it's joyful and everyone knows <laughs> it is. So if you want to try that app out, uh, try out Hollow. You can go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Hollow, H A L L O W. And you can try it out for free and see all these great features. Mm -hmm. Can't recommend it enough. Um, but yeah, Tim, uh, we'll make sure that all those links are there. Um, if you need anything from us to help participate in this, we're volunteering. Let yeah, us absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, for sure. Because each one oh, and of also, us. Also, hold on. Save us some tickets. It sounds like you're going to go fast. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to forget to log on at February 15th. He I know. Will. Yeah, he absolutely I know I'm going to forget it. I know I'm going to forget. <laughs> We will affirm that. Yeah, yeah. 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 He will definitely I'll forget. Definitely forget. So <laughs> we, just can, get... we can set some aside and we'll, yeah, let's, let's email, Thank I'll email you. Tim. you. I'm, I'm being sincere. <laughs> <laughs> he is. 
Um, you know, we've all had, I think, our conversions are Eucharistic based. I mean, you had yours in adoration. I had my reversion in adoration. Mm -hmm. You sleep alone in a bed every night by yourself. <laughs> it's We're, fantastic. It's fantastic it's because great. of that Jesus in the Eucharist. <laughs> Um, you know, it's like the funniest homily ever. I was like, wow, okay. Um, but it's important. And like I said, it's important that this is presented so that people really can make a decision. Because I don't think in this world we can just be passive anymore. The age of cultural Catholicism is over. It is like Pope Benedict said, we're in the age of heroic Catholicism where it is a conscious choice to believe and to follow. And the source and the summit of our faith being the Eucharist, we have to promote that. We have to love that. And we have to want to share that with others. Get him off the bench, man. Put right. him in the game. You know, That's I, what I, I made say, the bro. proposition years ago that I think that the next council of the church, they should consider and they should get the East together and say, we should put into the creed, the true presence in the Eucharist. Yeah, Cause it's that uh, important and that fundamental to I our faith. I think it's very important, you know, and that could be, you know, something now mm -hmm. I'm no Bishop and there's probably good reasons for that, but I think something like that, that impact. We all need to be grateful for that, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, point. if I was your bishop, you'd be the I'm first very bishop happy with, like, with my bishop. Yeah, your bishop. Nice. I don't want my bishop to go. Anywhere. I would assign you to the Arby's employee chapel. <laughs> <laughs> I heard an interesting thing recently of because we've been using this word encounter. Like, yeah. what are we trying to do? We're trying to help people encounter Jesus. And then uh, one of our employees for the Congress looked up, like, you know, the definition of encounter in, in uh, the dictionary, and it actually means like to meet as an adversary, like by definition encounter has this sort of like combat, like Jesus meets us where we're at and it's, it's all mercy and it's all love and it's all forgiveness, but everything in me in that, in like a true encounter that is not of him, like it gets burned away. Like it, 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 he is, he doesn't want that from, we need a God who, who hates what hurt, hurts us, who wants more for us, who helps make us into everything that we are. And so, yeah, there's something different about just like, it's not a true encounter is not just, you know, we, we kind of bump into Jesus so often at Sunday mass, a real encounter of those moments is, is the kind of thing that uh, it grips us and it challenges us. So it's like, yeah, it's like Jacob. I mean, you wrestle with God, God's chosen people, Israel, the name means they struggle with God. And that encounter is not supposed to be something passive. It's supposed to be something visceral and life-changing and all the things that are in you that are fighting your con your ability to convert are the things that are fighting God and God will defeat those but you have to enter into that encounter to let God defeat those things in you so that you can fully submit to his will and that's what I think I'm kind of trying to get to in this point that making this a binary decision this is what the church teaches do you believe this? Don't be apathetic. And that's the worst part of what I see in the church is apathy. Mm -hmm. It's good enough. I don't know. Do I believe it? I believe most of it. You know, we need to be on fire for the faith. And the Eucharist can be the thing that kindles that flame in our hearts. I'm just grateful the status quo is, you know, the bishops don't want that anymore. Yeah. I'm really happy about that. If, I mean, if that is bishops case, who are leading yeah. this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I know. And even just, you know, chatting with Bishop Holmeyer, you know, prior to this to this show, too. I mean, like, it's just exciting to, to yeah. kind of see the bishops move in college on this uh, very strongly. It's it's very, very exciting. As just a young priest, it's it's awesome. Not that young. I'm getting older. <laughs> I'm definitely looking a lot. I'm, yeah. You, you, you look great. You said I'm aging like a catcher's mitt. Uh, well, okay. um, I, was, I said more of a pumpkin, but okay. I <laughs> so I think it would just be phenomenal just to open up the word together. And, and, you know, Tim, you referenced it before, but John six, especially what we're talking about mm -hmm. right now. Um, you know, I'm going to start at uh, verse 29. Jesus answered them. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, this is what I love right here. Sir, Give us this bread always. <laughs> you know, 
give us this bread. And then it goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Mm-hmm. Jesus, the very next verse, I am the bread of life. So, that, you know, the, this encounter, huh? Like we encounter Jesus. We're the same. We're human beings. We're all, it's, it's humanity. When we finally encounter this, we're going to say the same darn thing that these guys said to Jesus 2,000 plus years ago. Yeah, I wouldn't call Jesus give, sir, though. Give, <laughs> I've always thought, I always thought that little detail was peculiar. Hey, I call, I call my bishop sir. Okay. So if if it's the son of God and be like, sir, like I'm on my, <laughs> yes, my face right now. Give me that bread always. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's amazing too because of the legacy that the Hebrew or the uh, Israel had, and and how this bread of life was inserted um, and given to them from mm-hmm. heaven mm-hmm. in in a time of great despair, in yeah. a time of great need. Yes. And I think you know looking at that legacy and they're recalling that legacy. Um, as they say that, and he, they say, give me this bread always because that is what sustained them in their time Amen. of need. Amen. Yeah. I mean, that's the typology in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the man of the Old Testament. That is, you know, Bethlehem. That is our Lord. Mary is the, new Ark, of the, of the mm-hmm. new Ark of the Covenant. She had within her Jesus. The old Ark of the Covenant had the manna. I mean, there's so much of that typology when you start looking at the Eucharist and the Old and the New Testament. But... You know, Tim, so this is, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a shout out to each and every one of you that are listening in and viewing this content on YouTube. Like, let's dive in. Duke and Altum put out into the deep, yeah. the depths of the Holy Eucharist and who Jesus is under this veil is the greatest mystery in front of us. It's the source and summit of our faith. So let's enter more deeply into communion with one another. Let's get mobilized, get behind this effort. Definitely check out Eucharist Congress, the, uh, the the website. Tim, can you tell us those links again? EucharisticRevival.org, sign up for the newsletter, and then EucharisticCongress.org for tickets, for information, for you know starting February 15th. And all those links are going to be below. Uh, Tim, it's a really, uh, I know that you guys have met, but it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, to understand what it is you're doing um, with the National Eucharistic Congress. Uh, we want to participate because we agree that this is just so important. So thanks for joining us. Yeah. Here's a, I'm just going to put a pitch out there before I have to go. Uh, Catholic uh, talk show at the Eucharistic Congress in 2024. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let, let's let's let the next time Done. we record together be at in Indianapolis. I just got goosebumps. Yeah. I got chills too. That's awesome. Jesus Done. is doing something big. That's right. awesome. I love it. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah, Tim. That's beautiful, brother. Well, God bless you, man. God bless you and the wonderful work that you're doing. You're radiating the light of Christ. And next time you come down and enjoy some of the uh, the radiance of Florida, make sure you hit us up. And, uh, you know, hopefully this is one of many shows to come so that we can really pick up some traction. And again, to everybody that's listening in, viewing, go to your pastor. He needs your help. And let's get this Eucharistic revival happening. God bless you. And we'll see you next week.